I've known uh, Pastor Ken for, man, I feel like it's been over 20 years. So 2000, no, maybe 1999. Yeah, 2000. And uh, love that I get invited back. Um, love that I've been invited back. I mean, I'm sure you've seen me bring this in. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. We, um, I have four kids. They're not here today. We, they're actually volunteering at the church that I normally go to. And um, over the years, it's been almost sort of a struggle for us because we don't want to celebrate Halloween. You know, it's one of those things that's like we struggle with that. Don't want to do that. We've always, for our kids, and we have other families that are similar, we would, uh, why don't you just come over? We'll have a bonfire, hang out. We have a pinata. Everybody leaves with tons of candy. You know, we dress up or do what, just kind of have fun together, right? And then we've been invited to some community parties to, to get together. So there's this whole torn part of our lives where it's like, we don't want to celebrate this, but we want to build these relationships with people. So I have my brother, who is not a Christian, lives in downtown Ortonville. And if you're familiar with that, I don't know what it's like around here, but they block off the streets. It is a crazy madhouse. There's the whole community comes from everywhere, gets together, hangs out, and everybody's nice, and they're talking, and you get to meet your neighbors and meet other people, and it's like this perfect time to build relationships, right? So over the years, we've struggled on and off. So anyways, this year, we went to a costume party. My wife created some masks for us. So we all wore these masks. And everybody was like, oh, those are so cool, because we were a whole family of Legos. Um, we were a whole family of Legos. We were Lego versions of ourselves, and um, it, we, just, we just had fun with it, really. And uh, my, kids, my kids loved it. My daughter, there was a day at school you could wear a costume, and she won first prize in her school. So we felt really cool, you know? So we just, I don't know, just had fun, had fun with the mess. And it's funny, I bring this in because Pastor Ken gave me a passage that you guys are going through in Luke chapter 6. There's actually a part where it talks specifically about masks. Um, so that's why I wanted to bring, bring that in. But we have, uh, uh, as I read through this passage, and what I love about um, when I come here is if I get invited to speak somewhere, there's sometimes where they're like, you can speak on anything you want, you know, uh, preferably in the Bible. You know, sort of joking, they'll usually say that. And... Um, you, and what I like about Pastor Ken is he's usually got, hey, could you speak on this passage? Because this is where we're at. And uh, sometimes it's overwhelming if you get called to, to come somewhere and they want you to speak on whatever you feel like. I prefer to have a section of scripture uh, that I get to focus on. And I know that that's what Pastor Ken did uh, for me here. So in Luke chapter 6, we're going to be in verses 37 through 45. And I titled this, No Better, No Better. And... The reason, is, as, I get, as I got through this passage, it talks about, there's, there's a section here where it talks about judging, condemning. There's, there's, there's four things that he, it's practical things Jesus is telling who he's talking to, what to do. Two of them are don't do's, two of them are do's. The, the do's are to, to forgive and give. The don'ts are don't judge, don't condemn. And so there's this whole section where it's talking about judging others and judging others as you get through this you realize if we if, if we know better as in understand that we understand that we ourselves are no better that we throughout romans it even says that for all of sin and fall short of glory of god like we are all in the same boat we are all not better you are not better than the person sitting next to you or your neighbor or anyone for we have all fallen short. And so, as I, as I read through this, that's really what hit me the most, is it's like, the, if we can come away from this, and to know and understand, to know better, that we are no better, then I think that we'll, and it's helpful to live the life that Jesus has called us to live. Um, I think that maybe, maybe even as we get older, um, at least I've noticed this, uh, in myself, we start to become more critical. We're critical not only of ourselves, but of others. And um, I always, it's easy to have an opinion of what somebody else should be doing with their lives. Um, we're like, oh, I don't think they should be doing that. Or, and, and 
what I've noticed too is it's not, it, it can creep in. And as it creeps in, that judgmental attitude. So to judge others really means or is to find fault in somebody else. And uh, as that creeps into our life, I feel like that really, really reveals something about ourselves and about where we're at with the Lord. And so um, as we get into this passage, though, I do want to do a quick recap. I know I haven't been or listened to all of Pastor Ken's messages on this, but it's really interesting. The audience here that, um, that Jesus is, is talking to, because it's a mixed audience. That's always important to know as we're getting into Scripture of who is this Scripture for? Like, what was happening? This is Jesus talking, and who is he talking to? And the audience, is, it's a mixed audience. It's not just his believers, but it says it is a large group of his disciples. A large group, so that's more than just the 12 disciples, but it's all other people who are living their lives, who are following Jesus, who have given their life to Jesus and following Jesus, and ha- are, are, are all in. They're disciples of Jesus, and they're following him, as well as all these other people. It's, it, it groups them into two people. There's basically people who are already believers, who are living their lives and following Jesus, becoming disciples. And then there are others that are really there out of curiosity or uh, what they can get out of it. Um, as, as you read through the beginning of uh, halfway through chapter 6, where it talks about there are people there that are interested because Jesus has been healing people. He's been healing, so people are trying to get close, to be healed, uh, to be able to just get close enough to touch him. So they're there for what they can get out of it. And uh, so you have these two mix and people that are just interested in, in learning more, learning more about Jesus. And with that, Jesus, I think it's got to be a confusing time because Jesus is so much different than their current church leadership. Um, the Pharisees were uh, religious leaders at the time who knew so much about the Bible. And I know that I, I get excited about Bible studies. I know you guys are having Bible studies. And um, there's, this, there's this torn part that I have with Bible studies, though, too, because the more you learn about the Bible does not mean the closer to God you get. Like, and the Pharisees and the current church leaders at the time are a perfect example of that. That there is, there is a difference. Even though... When you love the Lord and you want to to grow in Him and you want to learn more about Him, you're going to want to get into the Word and you're going to want to study it. And you're going to learn more about who you serve. And you want to learn more about what we've been called to do. And you're going to want the Spirit to speak through that and to to change you through God's Word. Because God's Word is living and it's powerful. It's like a double-edged sword, right? This isn't just something that is uh, is dead. It It is alive and it can change your life. So there's that side of it. But then there's also the side of, I'm just going to learn it to study it, to get knowledge, and as you get all those things, you do it, and it makes you feel better because you understand and you know more. When that is not what we're called to do, we're not called to to know more, to learn, to to just grow our knowledge in Him. We're called to grow closer to Him. So, Bible study is important, and to grow in our knowledge is important, but. I don't want it to give us a false sense of security. There was this time where I had a, um, I may have even told you guys this before, but I had this, uh, I had this oral presentation I had to give, I think in like fourth grade. I did it on Shaquille O'Neal. Um, I just thought he was super cool. I had his jersey, all the things, did all this research report. I had one of the bulletin boards that you put stuff on, and I did all this research. Like I knew everything about him, where he lived, how his shoe size, how long he played basketball, all those things, right? I knew everything about Shaquille O'Neal, but if I ever walked up to him in public, he would be like, who are you? I would freak him out. I was like, dude, I know your mom. I know, I know your mom's name. I know where you grew up. I know, like, I know, I know, I know, I know all these things. But like, that, is, that does not give me a relationship with Shaquille O'Neal. Like, it may really weird him out if I ever met him because I know all these weird facts about him. Same thing. Same thing with Bible study. So don't allow, don't allow your, your pure study to, to only give you knowledge. And that's why prayer is important when you get into that. And that's why, um, that's why having the right mindset and heart when you get into these Bible studies is so important.
Anyways, that was not even on my sheets today. That was a bonus. You're welcome. You're welcome for the bonuses. We're here for the bonuses. Okay. Um, but the thing about the Pharisees is, is that they really got critiqued because of what their focus was. Their focus wasn't an inward change. There's some scripture verses. I can't remember if I have them coming up. But in Luke 20, uh, verses uh, 46 through 47... It says, beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses for a show. They make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. And then in Matthew 23, I mean, there's all these verses. I ended up just picking out these two. Matthew 23, verse 27 through 28, it says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. These are the church leaders at the time. And that's what makes this interesting to me because Jesus is talking to everybody and he's so much different than their current church leaders. They're so much different because he is talking to them about the way they should be living their lives. And then when we are changed and when we give our life to the Lord, we are changed. And when we are changed, this is what our lives will look like. And he gives such a hard time to those who are currently in leadership because the people who are leading the church at the time, are missing the mark. They are leading people astray. Now, we go into, you guys, I know that Pastor Ken talked about this maybe two weeks ago, the blessings and the woes in this this section where he goes, uh, Jesus talks about that. And then Jesus begins to show what you do when you are truly changed. And that's uh, maybe last week. I'm not sure um, exactly because I I was reading through having love for your enemies. And love for your enemies, and I, was, I underlined a lot in my Bible, and this is from years ago, I had underlined three times in maybe a passage you guys were in last week where it talks about even the sinners, even the sinners, even the sinners. Even the sinners will love those who are good to them. Even the sinners. So we're called to love our enemies. And that is the part of being completely changed, completely changed by God, is that when you are changed, you are going to do things that are otherwise, that would never happen otherwise. Because that is something, you would have no reason to love those who do harm to you, who are trying to attack you, who are trying to, to love your enemies. There is no reason why you would ever do that. But that is part of the Spirit of God within us as we give our life to the Lord. And that shows true change. And I believe the reason why he's saying this in a mixed crowd is he's letting people know the difference between those who are truly changed, who have given their life to the Lord, and those who have not. And you'll see these differences, and he's pointing these differences out that I'm sure nobody else in the church at the time would have been talking about or saying. I sort of made my own definition of what a true Christian is. I feel like Christianity is, I mean, there's so, so much around it. I just... I basically made a quick definition saying that the true Christians are people who have given their life to the Lord, who have died to self, have new life in Jesus, and are completely and utterly changed inside. You are completely changed inside. Because when we, we're called to lay our life down and to give it to the Lord. I, I struggle with this question. Another bonus, guys. Um, I struggle with this question I run periodically, not as of late, okay, but I do like to, actually, I, I don't like running, okay? Does anybody really like running? Nobody likes running, okay? Let's not fool ourselves. We like to be in shape, okay? I like to, I like it, I like to be able to walk up the stairs and not feel like I'm going to pass out, you know? That's a, I work in downtown Pontiac, and there is no elevators. We're on the second floor. It's like 25 steps, and sometimes I get up to the top, and I'm like, did I just run a mile? Because that is the way I feel. And so I try to, to run. And all that being said, when I'm, the last time that I went running, I had this question in my head that was going through. 
on, on Christianity in, in general because the question, the question that, that spurred to mind that I thought about for a really long time is, is Christianity, is it free? Is Christianity free? Or, or does it cost everything? And I feel like it's only one of those two. We talk about how it's a free gift of God. Of course it is. Uh, throughout Scripture, it talks about how you can't earn it. It's by grace it's been given to us. Okay, because there is, there is there's something within us that typically will want to try to earn this salvation. So I'm going to try to do these good things. I'm going to try to be nice to my enemies. I'm going to try to do these things because I feel like I have to earn it in some way. And we know that that's not the case because we know that there is, there is nothing that we have done that could deserve the sacrifice that Jesus did for us. So it is a, it is a gift uh, by grace given to us. And there is nothing that we can do to earn it. However, to start this relationship, I mean, that is the picture of baptism even, is we've been called to lay our life down. When we make Jesus our Lord and Savior, when he is our Lord, he is our master, he is the one who we serve, we no longer serve ourselves, we give up everything. Uh, anything that was something that I, anything that was in me, for me, about me, is no longer as I am pursuing my master, my savior, I am living completely and wholly to serve and to please him. And that comes with willing to give up basically everything. And as you guys are going through Luke, I'm not sure if you're going through the whole gospel. I didn't talk to Pastor Ken about that. I know you're in chapter 6 right now. But you, that becomes more and more obvious as you read about Jesus. He's like, you've got to leave this behind. Let the dead bury their own dead. Like, uh, if you just got to go after me. You got to drop everything and go after me, and that is it. And to to get new life, we have to lay down our own. There's this exchange that takes place of laying down our lives, and then we become a new creation, new creature in Christ. Like we become brand new, wholly forgiven, completely new. Our whole past is gone. That is the beauty of the gospel, the good news. And so Christianity. That's why I have this definition. If it's people who have given their life, given everything to the Lord, and have died to self, have new life in Jesus, and are completely and utterly changed inside. There's this change that happens inside. And so, it's this, this is where we're at. So this is a big sort of overview and review, but this is the, the audience, this is what Jesus is talking about, and this is who he's talking about, and he is giving a glimpse of what our lives should look like when we are completely changed. And it's important for us to, to know better that we are no better. And that uh, the big idea for me here is that uh, changed people will judge less and forgive more. And so if there is really anything that you get from today, because I'm going to talk about a lot of things, and then sometimes I go down rabbit trails because I get excited because I've been thinking about this for a long time and there's all this stuff that happens within me that I'll probably share with you throughout, throughout this morning. But to, but to know that when we are changed and when, we had, when God has come into our life and changed us, that we will judge less and we will forgive more. And if we find ourselves judging often, that there is probably a heart issue going on. That there is some, that is, that is reveal, that should be revealing to us that the Lord has some work to do in our lives. And so these are some things that Jesus talked about in this group. So I want to, I want to read here um, at the beginning of this passage, uh, chapter 6 of Luke, verse 37 and 38. It says this, it says, do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So to do not, to do not judge. I was... He was just talking, like right before this passage, right before this, he's talking about loving. Talking about loving others, loving your enemies. And then he comes into this section where he's talking about not judging and not condemning. And I had written, written down in my notes that loving and judging 
they don't mix. Like they don't, they don't go hand in hand. I would say 99% of the time. Because when we're judging, we're finding fault in others, and as we're finding fault in others, what does that even do? What are we trying to accomplish? That's a common question I've been saying throughout my life, as I had my cousin say that to me one time when I was making job decisions probably 15 years ago. And like, he's like, well, what is, it? What, what is it you're trying to accomplish here? And like, for some reason, that was some weird epiphany in my life, and I still think about that all the time. And I say that to myself all the time regarding lots of different things. And so as I was reading through this, I'm like, all right, we do judge periodically, unless you're perfect in here, as I see a couple of you perfect ones, but the rest of us, like, we're not. And we judge a little here and there. And, but what, what is it, what am I really accomplishing when I look at others and I find fault in them? Why do I even do that? Because the Lord has called us not to do that. And I think part of the reason is, part of the harm in that really is on us. Because, Let's face the facts here. When we're judging, it's not always verbal. Like, some of us are really good secret little judges in here, aren't we? Like, we, like, we can judge and have nobody else know. It's just in my head that I have been critiquing someone and I don't like the way that they do something or I don't, like, I don't think they should be doing that or they shouldn't have said that or they should be doing this with their life instead of that. Like, to find fault in others is really a sign of of an issue within our heart because we're called not not to be looking at others to find fault in them because we're all we can all find fault in each other there's there there is no perfect person we've all fallen short of the glory of god and um i think that the reason why it's dangerous is that when we're finding fault in others there becomes this like false sense of self-righteousness like when i'm finding fault in others i start to feel better about myself i start to feel better about myself when that becomes a dangerous game because what is it i'm trying to accomplish what is it i'm getting out of this why do i continue to do this why is judging others becoming a problem in my life why is it become a regular thing in my life and it's probably because of what you get out of it. Like when we look at others and we judge others, it is likely because of the way, the good feelings that we can get about ourselves. And I believe, and I strongly believe that, it's just a dangerous game. And then right after he says, do not judge, he says, do not condemn. Or you will be condemned. I'm like, how, like what is the difference here Right? The difference between judging and condemning. Judging is finding fault. Condemning is looking at that person poorly because of the fault you found in them. So when we look at somebody and we find fault, that's to judge them. But to, to condemn them is to, is to look at them poorly and to look at them as, as though they are less. And there, that is where some of the real issues come, come, in, come into play because we have put ourselves sort of, we've, we've lifted up ourselves to put them, to put them down. At the, um, there's a section here starting in verse 41. I want to read through this because it has a strong relation to what we were just talking about. It says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take this speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye and then you will see, the, see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. There's this word in here, um, hypocrite. Hypocrite, and that's something that we've, we've used in church for a long time. You may or may not know where that originates from. So the hypocrite comes from the Greek word, I believe it's pronounced hypocrite. It's very similar. 
and it was from the first century BC. And they would have uh, Greek plays, and they would have an audience, and the Greek plays, as you can imagine, as people would gather for an audience, the stage could be pretty far, pretty far from uh, people in the audience. So what they would do is they would wear a mask. Hence, ta-da, probably not as cool as this one, but I imagine very similar. And um, they would have expressions on the mask. And it would always be men who were, who were in the plays, because um, men would play women and everything, and men were always the ones that were up there. And then, but when you're far away, it's hard to see their expressions. So they would wear different masks that would show either a big smile or a big sad face, and it would help with people in the audience to understand the emotions and the person and what they were doing and going through. And so the person who would wear a mask was called, what do you think? Hypocrite. Hypocrite. That's, that's where the word comes from. It's somebody who would act and who would wear a mask. And I, I mean, I joked around a lot when we were wearing these the other day because if you can imagine, I have four kids, it is like impossible, impossible to get a picture when everybody's smiling or everybody's eyes are open or somebody's usually crying or pulling hair or something crazy. And so our family photos to get everybody smiling is impossible. But that whole night when we were taking photos, legit, everybody's smiling. Everybody, not a saint, and I would joke. I'd be like, Jonah, did you blink in that one? And he'd be like, oh, dad, uh, you know, like, you can't, I mean, if you blink, I was like, everybody smile, everybody say cheese. It's like, it didn't matter. Every single photo of us that night was perfect. <laughs> perfect photos. We all had our perfect smile, just like this. Mine was just like this that night, too. Perfect. And, and it's, it's really a reflection. It reminds me of the things that Jesus is, it gets, he says and he calls the Pharisees hypocrites throughout the scripture. He gets really angry with them because their focus is on the exterior. The focus is on the exterior and it's like, you guys are hypocrites and that, that would totally relate to them. That would be very upsetting because it's basically it's like you are acting, you are pretending, and you are putting on a mask and you're spending all this time making sure that you look good on the outside. We spend a lot of time on these masks. I had people ask, him, ask us where we got them. You look inside, that's like insulation, and I got spray foam, and I told them I got it at Menards. <laughs> aisle 38, aisle 17, aisle 5, uh, you know, you go through the list, all the things. I thought it would be cheaper, too, to do it this way. It's not. We spent like $200, like, figuring this out. That pink foam right there, I'm thinking about taking it out and putting it in my walls. That's the two-inch pink foam. That's expensive stuff. Um, that they would, they would focus on the exterior. And we spent a lot of time on this, and I have pictures of my kids because we had to like sand them, and we made them do all their own work. They were getting into it, sanding it, and my daughter's, she's 11, she's very articulate, and she's very, uh, ar she's an artist, I wanna say artistry. That wasn't right though, as, as it was coming out, I knew that wasn't even a word, I was making that up as it went. She's very um, artistic, that's the word. She's very artistic and she, she's particular and she, she painted her own face and it looks super good. She did a really good job. But that reminds me of Jesus coming up to the Pharisees and giving them, being critical to them that they are spending all their time like painting, figuring out, making them their outer shell, making their outer shell look immaculate when on the inside they're rotting away, that they are falling apart that they're acting like everything's fine when it's not. And they don't have a relationship with God, yet the Pharisees were required to memorize the Pentateuch. That's the first five books of the Bible. I mean, if you get your Bible out, look at the first five books, and be like, can you imagine memorizing that? That's a lot. Right here. That's a lot of memorizing. <laughs> you know, that was part of their deal. Like, they knew the Bible. They knew it. They knew it, and they were broken, and they missed the point anyways. And as Jesus is talking to this crowd, mixed the people who are disciples and who are not, he is telling them that you need to stop judging and condemning. You need to stop looking at others and finding the speck in their eye when you have a two-by-four 
sticking out of yours. He's like, first, right, first, remove the plank out of your own eye, and then you can help your brother take out the splinter in theirs. He's like, and then he calls them a hypocrite. He's like, you are a hypocrite. You are a hypocrite because you are looking at others when you have so much to work on yourself. Like, you're here, and there's so much that needs to be done within you. And the Lord wants to do that. The Lord wants to change you. The Lord wants to work within you. And when we're not spending the time looking within, we are looking at others. And what is that accomplishing? There are people who know the Bible really well. And then the book of James, I'm reading through the book of James with another group of people, and we're going through, and it talk, there's a spot in there where it talks about how the Bible, it's like, it's like looking into a mirror, reading scripture and looking into a mirror and immediately forgetting what you look like. The idea is that you can look at the reflection of yourself through the word here, and you can start to see how I need to be changed and how I need God. And, and to, to use the word, we ought and we should, and it's here for us to read and to be a part of so that we can see our own reflection and so that we, so we can let God reveal to us the things that still need to be changed within us. But it's so much easier and it's so much more of our sinful nature to want to take this and then instead of going like this and like sort of revealing ourselves, the things that we want, we want to go like this to other people. We want to show it to other people like, oh, this is where you fall short. This is where you fall short. This is where you fall short. And that's, that's something that Jesus had to address with, with everybody here. He's like, you are hypocrites. If you're using scripture and your knowledge of him for anything other than judging yourself, and to find fault and to find the things where the Lord needs to work on in your life. If you're using it for anything other than that, then you're a hypocrite. And there is a small section, because I did look at, there is actually a small section in Romans where the Apostle Paul says that it is important to actually judge other, other believers in a loving way. That there are, there are times where there is sin that has to be dealt with within the church. But he even says in Romans that we do not judge others who are outside the church. The Lord, like, we share the gospel with them. We share the good news with them. We, we share, we share that, that they are broken, but that there is a solution and that the Lord has died for them and that there is forgiveness available, but to, sit, to judge and critique is not our role for them. For in, you have to do it in a loving way within the body. And that is a, that is a hard game to play. And I know that's what we naturally all want to do. We just want to we feel like we're really good at finding fault at others. But when there's serious sin that has to be dealt with, that is, there is a time and there is a place, I don't want to say never, that, that judging, even that same word is used throughout Romans, that judging within the church is to, to be a, in a loving way, is to help a brother or a sister in Christ to come out of any sin that's in their life and to get that pointed out, to call them out and do it in a loving way. That is where the word hypocrite comes from. It's from putting on a mask. So let's, let's look at our own lives and let's not, let's not put on the mask anymore. Let's live who we are, let's be who we are, and let's be forgiven. There is, I want to end here, there's this, a couple sections here where it talks about to-dos. And the do's were, if you remember, they said don't judge, don't condemn, but do two things. Do forgive and give and give generously. And that's, he's given an example of somebody pressing and measuring. Because when they would do commerce, they would have things to measure, like wheat and things. And so some people would try to fluff it up a little bit and to not have to, you know, if you're selling a, a gallon of wheat or something, like to like put it in there so it's like kind of fluffy so you're not giving as much as you think you would as a measuring tool. He's like, use that measuring tool and press it in, smash it in, put more in there. He's like, be generous when you're dealing with others. But he's also saying, forgive. And this is one of my favorite quotes. I read this when I was a late teenager, I read this. Um, it was a book called Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. And I read this and I underlined it and I never forgot it. And I still, even when I was putting this message together, I didn't even have to look it up. I can still quote it. He said that forgiveness is like setting a prisoner free and then later realizing 
the prisoner was me. And that forgiveness, although it is hard to do, Jesus here is telling us we don't judge, we don't condemn, but we forgive. And we forgive. And there's a power in forgiveness. And it's not even for that other person. It is for you when you forgive. And by forgiving, I feel like maybe it needs to be said, you are not saying that whatever trespass or whatever, anything that was done to you is okay. You're not saying that, that, that it's not a big deal. You're not saying that you weren't hurt. You're not saying any of those things. And you're not giving that person a way out. But you are experiencing what God has done for you. He has forgiven you and all that you have done towards him. And to, to have forgiveness in your life, that is a sign that you have a strong relationship with the Lord when you, when you are able to forgive. And when we are giving, or able to give others generously. So all that to say, if we are judging others, finding fault in them, looking down on them, having a hard time forgiving others, and having a hard time being generous with what we have, that is an overall sign that there is a problem within that may need to be addressed. I want to read this last scripture, and then we're going to, we're going to close out here at the end. Verses 43 and following it says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. This is how Jesus ends this section right here. He goes into talking about building your life on the foundation. But he's He's telling them that you can recognize when change has occurred, you can recognize the good or the evil within a person by the things that they do. And I do think that there's times where we can pretend for a little bit and we can put on this mask and we can make everything look okay. But when we have a life where we are not living in a way that is forgiving, that is non-judgmental, that it, it's revealing that we have a heart problem. That we, have a, that, are, that we may not be the tree that we think we are. We have, the leaves are gone. The leaves are gone. I spend a lot of time leaf blowing. Depending on how big your yard is, maybe you took care of your leaves, or maybe you just say, pray the Lord blows it to your neighbor's yard. And that prayer was probably answered last night. Probably, probably in the next county. Um, but to, to clean up, where was I even going with that? I just got excited. I got excited about leaves there for a minute, guys. You got excited about leaves? Man. But, oh, that's right. We have trees in our yard, so uh, we're really, I want to say frugal, but face the facts, we're, I'm a little cheap over here. So we're cheap. And um, by my pond, I had these maples that started growing. Um, and I'm like, okay, I don't want to screw this up. I got three or four little maples over there, but a bunch of trees. But you can tell, you can tell what kind of tree it is, obviously, by the leaves. And I'm like, when fall hits, it's supposed to be a good time to transplant, right? You guys probably no better than me, but when it comes time to transplant, I don't want to kill these trees off, so I want to do it during a good time. So now's a good time. But now I don't know which ones are the... <laughs> I don't know which ones are the maples. <laughs> so now, I got to wait till next year. I'm putting a little ribbon on them or something. I don't want to transplant a cottonwood or something like that and ruin my front yard. Um, Jesus is saying that you can tell who they are by the fruit that they have. You, and like, like I can tell the type of tree I have by its leaves, you can tell the type of tree it has by the fruit that it bears. So Jesus is saying to a, group of, to a mixed crowd, I can tell who is saved, who has given their life to the Lord, and who has not, based off of the fruit or the actions in their life, based off of these things. So although we just talked about condemning and judging and and giving and forgiving. You can even do those things without being changed for a short time. But the goal here is that we would be a real, true Christian. That we would give our life to the Lord, lay it completely down, that he would change us completely. 
and that we're going to see these fruits, we're going to see these actions in our lives, and it's going to be different, and we're going to live different, and we're going to be different than those who we encounter, because my opinion is we cannot encounter the God of the universe, the one who created everything. We can't encounter him, truly, and not be changed. And so I think it's time that we that we just know we just know better that we're that we're no better. And I think that if we are truly changed, we're gonna see that we judge less and that we forgive more. So let's let's just pray as we as we finish this evening, this morning. Rather, God, we are we're thankful for Jesus. And we're thankful for your sacrifice, we're thankful for the way that you love us. Like, there is nothing that we have done to earn your love, yet you love us anyways. And Lord, there is times where, where we put on this mask. There is times where we are pretending to be something that we're not. There are times when, when we are that hypocrite. And Lord, I just want to pray today, this morning, that you would help reveal to us how you want us to be changed. Reveal to us the areas of our life that you want to come in, to work in, and to change completely. You are the one who makes us the tree that we are. Lord, store up good within us so that we have good fruits in our lives. And help us to recognize if we're living a life that needs to be changed. A life that needs to be laid down before you. And a life that needs to be forgiven. Lord, we are here to worship and to honor you with our lives. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you.